So welcome everybody. For those that don't know me, I'm Bill Ashley. Um, I'm a, one of the board members here at Grace Community and I also uh, chair our finance committee. So I don't know, you might say numbers are near and dear to me. So the finance side of this is, is important, but, but it's all important. And uh, you know, I organized this event because how often I run into somebody that's not prepared and that included my wife and myself for a period of time where we knew we needed to be dealing with things and how often, you know, if you ever ask anybody, oh, do you have your will in place? Well, we've been talking about it. Oh, how prepared for you for retirement are you? Well, we've been talking about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, there, there's a point in time when it's too late, right? So this evening is just, it's educational, it's casual, don't hesitate to stick your hand up in the air. We're going to have a Q&A session here. And I'll just warn you, if you don't ask questions, you're going to have to listen to a lot more of me. Okay? So be prepared to ask questions. So some quick introductions here. Um, this is uh, Jane Williams right next to me. So Jane is an estate lawyer. And uh, she's also, uh, her and her husband are near and dear friends. And uh, we've known, known them for about 15 years now. And, and, you know, I, I can give testimony for her legal work. She does do uh, uh, my family's legal work. She's done my kids. I think you've done one of my siblings, haven't you? Or, oh, yeah, well, okay, that's right. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. So pretty sure I know several people that she's done. Uh, um, and I, I don't get kickbacks or anything like that. Down at the far end of the table, Jack Hansen. He's a financial advisor at the Ed Jones office uh, where Cindy Sherman works. So Cindy's been with Jack for quite a long time and always spoken very highly of him. And here in the center, Dr. Mark Lales, president of the Nazarene Foundation, and probably half of you wondering what the heck is the Nazarene Foundation. So we'll have an opportunity to learn about that. And uh, uh, Mark was my daughter's Megan, the most of you know Megan Motley. Uh, Mark was her first full-time employer when she worked at the uh, foundation and, and uh, I was always so thankful that he gave her a job so she could move out. It was a very <laughs> blessed moment in our family and uh, uh, did a great job and now she's you know, freelancing and doing a little work for Mark here and there including uh, uh, when he became president apparently helping spiff up his resume so that uh, he could move up the ranks in the organization. So a uh, little highlight introduction there. So what we're gonna start with here for just a minute, and we'll just work our way down the table. You do have a microphone in front of you. Speak closely to the microphone. Don't hold it down here because it doesn't work very well. You have to hold them up here, okay? So anyway, we'll start here with Jane and just um, tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, and anything you'd like to share with us. Okay. Are you sure? Is it on? Yep. I'm echoing badly. Um, I'm Jane Williams, and I am an estate planning attorney. Um, my office is just barely into Missouri. Um, just It's on uh, 435 in Holmes. So I represent people on both sides of the state line. I'm licensed in both states. Um, my husband and I live up north of the Legends in what's called Piper. Um, and we just moved there two years ago from Lenexa. So, and I grew up in Wichita. So actually, we're Kansas people. Um, but my office just happens to be just into Missouri, which has really turned out to be a very good location because Missouri people want a Missouri address. And Johnson County people don't want to go very far. <laughs> so <laughs> they can just jump on 435 and get off right after they pass the state line. So it's been good. So what I do is um, I help people, families, individuals, all kinds of people to um, help them find their way through estate planning. And, um, you know, they come to me from all places, all walks of life. And in my opinion, every single person needs an estate plan. It can be as simple as a will for an individual, um, but that's what I do. And I do it because I want to help people. I want to make it smoother for them when they pass for their kids. So 
That's what I do. So, you were sharing with us that over dinner, you were a late to life lawyer. Oh gosh, late is really a problem for me. <laughs> well, what do I have to say? How late kidding. to life? We'll I'm just, just say kidding. you didn't come out of college with a legal degree. I did not. I was a teacher. I taught kids with behavior disorders for about 20 years. And then I quit teaching and went to law school full time. Um, and I graduated from law school in 01. So now I've been a lawyer for 21 years. And if you count all that up, you'll figure out how old I am. I, you didn't have to go there. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, Mark, tell us a little bit about y yourself and what sure. you're about. Mark Lale, I'm a Nazarene minister uh, that uh, I pastored 22 years in upstate New York and Ohio. 2008, I came out here to our Global Ministry Center, which is now located in Lenexa, to be the director of stewardship, and kind of evolved over into the work of the foundation, uh, where I feel very at home, very fulfilled in my call, and feel like I'm doing the right things. You said this was where we talk about ourselves, right? Yep. All right, so uh, I have a passion for a few things other than Jesus, uh, like anti-tractors, uh, farming stuff in general, get hit and miss gas engines, and uh, maybe one of the, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm kind of a fundraiser for the denomination. I've also been asking people for money at auctions since I was 18. So I, I'm one of the people that uh, stands in front of people occasionally and says, hey, so I've been asking for money for a long time. You, and you did that here at one point I, in time, if I remember did. right. Yeah, we had yeah. an auction here one time. So maybe the most important thing I can tell you about myself right now, and this bill affects you a little bit since Megan worked for me. And uh, I, We have five daughters. My fourth daughter is in her second year of teaching, uh, and she is a, a kindergarten teacher at Dayton Creek Elementary. Just, just a stone's throw up the road here a little bit. She's, she's 26, pretty, still lives at home, and uh, uh, and I'm, I'm discounting the dowry for anybody in the Spring Hill Church of the Nazarene. So. Okay. Well, you know, pass picture around later. I don't know how many. Do we have any young single guys in here? I don't know. But you know, you young guys that have single friends, think about it. There we go. Jack, go ahead and introduce yourself there. Okay, can you hear me now? You're on. Yep. Okay, good, good. Well, I've got a 25-year-old, Mark, that I'll line up with your 26-year-old. I'm, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, we'll have a dowry bidding war. So, uh, Jack Hansen, and I am with Edward Jones, and um, uh, I have my wife April here with me tonight. And yes, I work with Cindy, and um, we have an office at 159th and Merland, just up up the road from here, not too far. So, um, you know, Jane, I'm from Baser, Kansas, which is the Piper arch rival. We also uh -huh. used to play um, Spring Hill in sports when I was a kid. So I don't play many sports anymore. As you may have noticed, I'm blind, but I'm over it, so you can be over it too. So um, I've got two girls, a 25-year-old who is a nurse in the NICU at, um, uh, St. Luke's on the plaza, and then I've got also a 20-year-old who has been trying to find herself, but I think she has. She's at in esthetician school now, and I'm looking forward to all the pre-facials that uh, she's going to be handing out. So um, we live in Oakland Park, and um, uh, I uh, love doing what I do, and I feel like I'm very blessed to have the opportunity to do what I do being blind. Um, and I actually used to work for the Church of the Nazarene Harvest Partners, um, you know, Jesus Film Partnership Harvest Partners is what it's, it's had a couple different names. But, uh, you know, I really felt like that would, was my calling, it was ministry. And, you know, that ministry made a huge difference over time. And then um, one day they up and fired us all. So, um, but that's how I found Edward Jones and. Uh, found my true calling. Sometimes the Lord has to kick you out the door, kicking and screaming. And I'm really glad that that happened. And uh, Edward Jones has been a place where I can truly make a difference in people's lives. And um, after 20 years, really starting to see the benefits of that and the people that I've been working with. So when she asked to wax your eyebrows, are you in? Yes. Okay. <laughs> 
I do whatever she tells me to do. She's kind of bossy. Okay, <laughs> there you go. I got it. Okay. Well, well Jack, while we, we've got you, you know, talk a little bit about what is the role of a financial advisor? What do you, what do you actually do? Do you, like, earn fortunes for people? Or you tell them how to spend their money? What's the, what, do you, what do you view as the nature of the role as a financial advisor? Uh, it, it's changed a lot since I started, and it's rapidly changing right now. Uh, the industry that I work in is is in just a transformational period. When, when I started out, I would call people and say, hey, you know, I got this great stock. It's paying a dividend to this. You want to buy some? And they'd tell me no, and I'd call the next person. So, But over time, it has evolved to where you become more of a consultant. And I, I really struggled early on with the sales aspect of, of being a financial advisor. And I had a mentor that told me one day, he said, you know, you're really struggling, aren't you? I said, yes. And he said, you need to see your, you're one of those Nazarene boys, right? I said, yes. He said, you need to see yourself as a minister of money. And it just, he's one of those guys that speaks into your life, and he's done that several times for me. And um, that transformed my thinking. And uh, so, you know, the focus in our practice over time has evolved to be, uh, you know what, if, if we don't have like account minimums, if we feel like we can make a difference in your life, we want to work with you. If you're coachable and you want to listen and you want to learn. Um, so what we do is we figure out where you are and um, we listen to your story. I think that's really important. Um, you know, financial advisors, you can go and buy stocks and bonds now just on the internet. Where I can bring value is, is you know, asking the right questions and listening and helping people figure out you know, what brings meaning to their lives, what, um, what their purpose is, and um, understanding that about them, and then using money as a tool to help them achieve those dreams or goals that they have. And there's, you know, there's four or five big goals that people work on, but there's really you know, 40 or 50 different things that people want to do. And, and we also help people transition through life. You know, there's, there's obvious things like um, retirement, educating children, um, life insurance. Um, but there's 50 or 60 different transitions that people go through in life. You know, some folks get divorced. Um, you know, I have experienced that. I have a lot of empathy for that. Not, not that I got divorced personally, but growing up as a child of divorce um, gives me a lot of empathy for those types of things. And so um, people lose parents, people lose siblings, people um, have, you know, lose jobs. And there's a lot of psychological aspects for some people. When I lost a job at the Church of the Nazarene, it really threw me for a loop. I don't mean to badmouth the Church of the Nazarene here um, because it was a good thing. But um, just helping people walk through those transitions. Um, and, and also, um, I like to get a hold of people early because there's so many mistakes that I made when I was growing up. So when we talk about money stories, sometimes I'll share my story. My parents, um, my dad eventually had a good living. He's in the grocery business and owned a grocery store. But prior to that, you know, I, we, we seemed to have money, but it was all gone. And, and so I learned that kind of spending habit from my family. And, and I carried that into my marriage. And so April and I struggled a little bit early on. Um, and now here I am a financial advisor. But, you know, you wouldn't want it to take advice from a 30-year-old Jack. So... <laughs> Um, but, um, you know, just, just that story and, and understanding how you, it's never too late to start. Um, so we try to help people understand that. One of my favorite things to do is sit down with folks who think they can't retire. They're 50 something years old. They come in. Well, I don't know. Somebody, my brother told me to come see you. I don't think I'll ever be able to retire. And we sit down and we, we get to know them and we understand what their needs are, their lifestyle is, and how much money they need. And we'll run it through our software, and all of a sudden they'll see, you know what? You may not be able to retire at 65, but 66 looks pretty good. And you haven't even really done what you needed to do. So um, those are some of the things that we do. Well, one thing we know for sure, everybody's going to retire, right? Inevitable, right? It's in that category. Now, Mark, talk about the Nazarene Foundation and what the heck is the Nazarene Foundation and, and what all do you do? And, and, and by the way, be, be, before I forget, because I probably will forget, uh, um, over on the table by the exit door over there, there there's some business cards from all three of them. If you want to be able to get a hold of them, you can grab them. There's also a bunch of brochures, which is what made me think about it. Uh, there's a stack of brochures from the foundation on all the different services they offer. 
So there's our, our advertising pitch there. So anyway, go ahead, Mark. What, what does the foundation do? Why is there a foundation? Okay, so the foundation is 18 years old, and it was invented uh, by the denomination, and started by the denomination, fully owned by the denomination, the Church of the Nazarene, uh, in order to uh, assist uh, with helping people give their money away or their things away, uh, specifically planned gifts. Uh, so um, <clears throat> we, we make it very clear we're not financial planners or attorneys, uh, we're gift planners. So we help accomplish some of the goals uh, that we are committed to, and that's helping you get as much money to your family as possible, as much money to your church as possible, and as little money as possible to the IRS. That's where we uh, take people down that path. Uh, we have, uh, <clears throat> We provide language for beneficiary requests so that uh, there's no confusion at the end of the life. We're kind of the Nazarene experts on dispersing your assets at the end of life. A lot of times Nazarenes, we're a really tight denomination, close, and have a lot of connectivity. So we have people that want to uh, make a gift to Olivet Nazarene University and Mid-America and their local church and the church that they attend while they're in Florida. Uh, so we uh, kind of serve as the conduit to make sure all the Nazarene money goes all the right directions once you go to heaven. But it goes a lot farther than that. We handle gifts of real estate for local churches across the, across the country. Um, we, are, we are not just fundraisers for the denomination. We are just as committed to gifts going to the local church. Uh, so we handle gifts of stock for uh, churches, uh, gifts of non-cash items, in some cases uh, businesses, entire farms full of stuff, real estate. Uh, let's see, Herefords Grain. We do a significant amount of grain every year. It's a real uh, tax break for a farmer uh, to give their grain as their tithe rather than selling their grain, paying tax on that, and then giving the money away that's left over after that. So we help people avoid capital gains tax whenever we can on things. And um, <clears throat> really, it's, it's about generosity and stewardship. We do a lot of motivation to, uh, for people to help them get their will done. And sometimes I feel like uh, you have to catch people right in the sweet spot of readiness in order to do this. Uh, and uh, we motivate, you know, we motivate and motivate and say, uh, you should have an estate plan because uh, it's better stewardship for you to decide who's gonna care for your children and what's gonna happen to your money than for the state of Kansas to make those decisions. It's a lot better, you're a much better steward. There's, a, there's no chance the state of Kansas is gonna give anything to your church. You do that ahead of time. But there has to be a readiness in there, we believe, it's a little like uh, motivating people to, uh, to go on a diet. I know I can stand one, uh, and I know what to do about it. I know to eat less and exercise more, but my, my head's not there yet. You know what I'm saying? Being ready for your estate plan is a little bit like that. You need to get to the place where I always know I should do this, but now I'm serious about it and want to make that happen. When that happens, we want to be there with all the resources that we can. So, uh, <clears throat> so we, we help people follow God into gifts. I had a couple call me uh, not too long ago that said, uh, we'd like you to stop at our house. They were in Tennessee and we have something we need to obey the Lord. So when I got there, they, um, they, they just told me their story a little bit. They said, God's supposed to do something and we don't know what it is, but it's on the mission field somewhere and we're supposed to give this. And they slid a, a bag, a brown paper bag across the table for me to take with me. Uh, and uh, I opened it up and it was full of gold bullion. So uh, I kind of got the impression that this family could have given several thousand dollars away, but God told them that they were supposed to give this away. Here's, go back to the Old Testament. I have something, I'm supposed to give it to the Lord. It's the best I have. I think their grandkids probably played with those coins and uh, it was very meaningful to them. They had tears in their eyes and they said, God needs this. And so uh, <clears throat> that was the day since I flew there that I learned that uh, the TSA has questions for you when you get on an airplane with a backpack full of gold. Uh, but we got it to Kansas and got it liquidated and, and uh, took it over to Global Mission and they said, this is just the size of a project that we didn't know where the money was gonna come from. So I feel like a lot of my job and the fulfillment of my ministry is helping people accomplish their, their generosity that is God-born. Thank you. All right, Jane, so maybe a couple of questions for you. We'll start getting a little, little deeper in some of the technical here. Okay. You guys have a heck of a lot of jargon in your business, well, <clears throat> but you're a teacher. That's correct. So you're going to make this all simple for us. So why don't you give us a quick rundown of all the different types of documents one should be aware of and familiar with when you start talking about estate planning. 
And, and, and I do want to just as a quick aside, I'm just kind of looking around the room at, at age. So for you, uh, those of you that still have a full head of hair and it's not all gray yet, there is no time like now. It's the old story, sorry, Dan. The, uh, 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 you know, there's, it's like the story about planting a tree. You know, 30 years ago was the best time to plant a tree and the next best time is today. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad uh, uh, for those of you to be here and, and be thinking about this because there is, you know, and Jack, we'll talk with Jack about that in a few minutes, but there is no time like now to start. So, okay, Jane, I, I get to slip in every now you and then, did. so go ahead. That's very true. And really, uh, my business piggybacks a lot with yours um, as far as planned giving and um, leaving certain assets to a charity um, for tax purposes or just for charitable purposes. Um, so what I do is I create wills and trusts. I call those the anchor documents of your planning. So you would either have a will-based plan or a trust-based plan. And it comes in a package. So not only do you have the will or the trust, which give each one of those gives instructions about how you want your assets to go once you pass, but not only that, there are provisions for what if you become incapacitated? Who's gonna take over managing your trust assets? Also a durable power of attorney for finances. You need both of those because as trusts work, um, not everything can be in a trust until after you die. For example, an IRA. And you have to own an IRA as a human person. And um, if you were to transfer an IRA into your trust, it would be a taxable event, it would blow the whole thing. So instead, somebody who isn't in charge of the trust has to be available, if you become incapacitated, to manage that IRA, or manage your life insurance, or manage anything that you're gonna leave in your name during your lifetime. So that authority comes from a durable power of attorney for finances. And then of course we have the healthcare documents and most people are most familiar with those. They ask you every time you go to the hospital because they're required by law to do so and they say these words. Do you have a living will? Oh no, do you have a healthcare power of attorney or a living will? And you say yes or you say no and they may go on. But, but that healthcare power of attorney is probably the most important thing that I do. If you le lose your mental capacity and you cannot make your healthcare decisions on your own, that's where you wanna be really well planned. You wanna know who do you trust to make the decisions that I would be making if I could. Um, and the way I happen to do healthcare powers of attorney is I make them immediately effective. That means that my husband right now could make a medical decision for me like that. But the document that I create actually says that I have to be asked first. It has to be discussed with me first and only if I cannot communicate, then my husband can communicate on my behalf. So it says, um, if I am able to communicate in any manner, however rudimentary, even by blinking my eyes. So what I like to just emphasize is that you get to make your own healthcare decisions until you can't, but you need someone you trust and care about and who cares about you to be able to make those decisions. Another healthcare document is the living will. That's an advanced directive, they are the same there are two words for the same thing. Uh, synonymous, I think they say. Anyway, so um, that's the document. It doesn't put anybody in charge. It just expresses your end of life wishes. And in today's world, lots and lots of people, great majority of people who come to see me want to have that living will. It just says, hey, if I am not able to make my own decisions, and there's no reasonable hope of regaining mental functioning or getting um, better and going ahead and living, then I don't want to be kept alive like that. Um, 
time. And most people feel that way these days. It's kind of interesting. Um, I think a lot of things have have played into that. And do you all remember the um, story of Terry Schiavo in Florida? Yeah, so she um, died, well, she was in a very terrible accident. She was 35 and she was in a persistent vegetative state. And her parents wanted to keep her alive. And her estranged husband thought he knew that she would not want to be kept alive under those circumstances. Well, she didn't have a living will. She had not expressed her wishes. And so it had to go to court. And if you remember it, it was all over the papers and there was all kinds of litigation and I mean, horrible stuff going on for someone who's about to lose their loved one or in essence has already lost her. But that's a, the healthcare documents are extremely important. And then there's a HIPAA authorization. You hear HIPAA all the time um, because your doctor makes you sign something probably every time you go. Um, but it just says, if I can't name the people I want the doctor to talk to, then these are the people I want to be able to get a hold of my personal health information, my protected health information. So it's a whole package. One thing I want to say <clears throat> that I usually even start with when I talk to folks is that the great majority, the vast majority of people believe that if you have a will, you avoid probate. And that's not true. So a will does nothing to avoid probate. So if you've heard that, and most of us have, in a church basement, in a coffee shop, just talking to friends, well, I got a will, so now I can avoid probate. And that's not the way it works, and you should know that. If anything, if you want your instructions that you write in your pretty little will, you want somebody to follow those, leave it in thirds to your kids, things like that, that can't happen without it going through the probate court. And the court saying, yeah, that's fine, you can do that, but it, it has to have a probate. So what we typically do if somebody has a will-based plan is we just make sure that every single item they own has a beneficiary named. And the beneficiary names um, go out and around, they do an end around um, the will. So if everything you have has a beneficiary named on it, then it won't go through the probate, but you still need a will. Because, here's an example, if someone um, dies in a car accident and it's the other guy's fault, then um, you, you might get a settlement check, but you're already gone, and it does not have a beneficiary on it. It has no place to go. So it has to go through the probate process and according to the instructions in your will. So <clears throat> for most people, there's a reason to have a trust based plan, but not everyone. There are people, and there are lawyers who don't believe in this, but there are people who can do just fine with a will-based plan, which is less complicated and less money. Um, but that's what I offer, and um, we were talking at, when I was eating about um, blended families, and that is one of the most, those are the most important people to come plan, because it's very, very easy to accidentally disinherit your children in, in a um, blended family. Or purposefully. What's that? Or, or you do it on purpose, but sorry. Oh, yeah. Side yeah. Right. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I, I really love what I do. Um, I've been doing this, did I already say this, for 21 years now. Graduated from law school in 01, and I teach every day. That's what I do. I teach every day. So thanks for being here. And um, if you want to grab a card, we just set up a no cost strategy meeting. And then we'll go over what I think maybe will work for your family. And then you can decide after that if you want to move forward. So there's really no harm, no foul. You, you just pick up my card over there and, and give us a call. We'll get you scheduled. And, and you will get an educational session. My wife and I got quite a bit out of it when we went and visited with her the first time. You know, my, my son, 24-year-old, you know, is a great example. I'm allowed to say that he's a client because I paid the bill. But 
when he moved when he moved out, we're like, let's get a will. We already had we actually already had uh, health care power of attorney and, and HIP authorizations in place for all of our kids. And I and I will tell you how valuable this can be, not with my children, but my wife and I help a, an older woman lives here in Spring Hill that ha has in the past come to Grace Community, and, and she's got no infrastructure to help her. She don't have any family or anything. She's had several hospitalizations. And my health care power of attorney for her is actually, unfortunately, now on file at every hospital in Johnson County. Well, the good news is, you know, if something happens and she gets transported by ambulance, I can call them, you know, and they're like, well, who are you? And I'll tell them who I am and I'll say, I'm, I'm health care power of attorney and I am in your computer. And you hear click, 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 and they, what do you want to know? They will share freely. They'll put me with a nurse in the emergency room if need be. And then along with that, She's, she's got her, her living will, and I sat with her and I said, what do you really want? Make sure I know and understand what this is expressing. And I'm like, guy, really, you want them to work that hard to keep you alive? And she says, yes! I said, okay, we're, you know, we're in sync, right? So, so part of this is, is in the preparation of the forms, it's actually an opportunity for dialogue. You know, you might think you know, but maybe you really don't, right? And this really forces you to talk through some issues, right, when you get into it. You know, what do you want to leave to the kids? And everything you know may be right, too, but there's more that you don't know because you just haven't experienced it. And, and so, uh, yeah, I, I just tell everybody, I don't care if you go to a different lawyer, please do the planning. Please do the planning. So, Jack, let's talk about financial planning a little bit more here. So, I know you, you you like to help people kind of get on track and stuff. I guess what's, you know, if there's two or three really, really important things that you'd want to convey to a client or to the people here, what do you, what would you like them to know and be aware of as they think about financial planning? And, and by the way, I mean, look at the age stratification in the room. We're not talking about just retirement, right? It, financial planning is important when you're 18 Right, and it's important when you're 30, and it's important when you're 70 and you're 80. Every point in your life, financial planning has value, right? So, yeah, you know, speak into that, uh, Jack. Well, you should always. Uh, the first thing that I would caution against is is getting into debt too much. And you know, I did that. Uh, was it? I went to Mid America. I remember the date. It was probably like 1989. I opened up my mailbox at Mid-America, and there was a, well, American Express thought Jack Hansen ought to have a credit card. Well, sure. And um, so that's, that's a big mistake that young folks really, really need to avoid. Live on what, what you earn. And um, you know, I think it's okay to have a mortgage to get your home, but if you can avoid auto debt, um, I think um, April was telling me the other day, she heard something on the radio, they went around at a car dealership and asked people what their average car loan was, it was like 1300 a month, 1400 a month, and that just blows my mind. Um, you know, you can have a house for that. So, um, maybe not a great house, but at least a house. So, um, avoid debt, because if you start from underwater, you can't breathe. And it's, it's really difficult to be successful financially until you get yourself out of debt. Um, uh, the other thing I would say is start early for young people, um, and, and Thankfully, I've got both of my girls that are savers, and um, you know, my daughter who's a nurse saves 10% um, of, of what she earns. I think it's actually 15% now, and you know, there's a match where she works, and if you do that, if you just save 10% and take whatever match you can get, you'll have choices when you're in your 50s. And that is really, Really, the key is to be able to get to the point where you have choices, where you're not forced to do something. So, sacrificing early, uh, the time value of money, time really matters. You know, your money should double every seven to ten years when you invest it in a good 401k or an IRA, or you're just simply investing. You know, it should double every seven to ten years, and that makes a huge difference over the long term. So that's. That's my advice for young people. If you have a family, make sure you've got life insurance. It's cheap. You get a million dollar policy in your 20s for 20 bucks a month. And that's a really critical thing that I make sure whenever young people come to see me, if they have a mortgage or 
you know if they have children especially making sure that they're covered for that type of disaster and we look at things like disability i'm disabled if you have disability at work that's offered to you make sure you're taking advantage of that even if it costs a little extra because um you got about a 70 percent chance of being disabled at some point in your life you need to have surgery or whatever so just looking out for those types of things and then um you know we love to help people plan um when you retire nobody wants to you know live on proverbial dog food and you know not go anywhere you want to have the same lifestyle and so that's one of the things i can help people do is to know how much they need to be saving at a reasonable rate of return to be able to retire and have their same lifestyle or a better lifestyle i think that's what most of us want um you know and when, when you are retired um one of the things that is really critical for people especially in a down market is, is i don't know if anybody noticed but is the stock market down right now yeah don't talk to me i don't want to talk about it okay no that's what i do is i help people through those times those challenging times and we're going to have those that you know we're going to three good years one bad year that's just how it works um we're going to have difficult events in the world on a regular basis um, so I love to help people navigate that as you get older you've saved money you want to be aggressive when you're young and then as you get older you want to be a little more conservative and then when you're retired we want to make sure that you have at least a year or two or even three if you're really conservative of income set aside in a CD or cash or bonds um, so that when difficult times like this and your portfolio is down 15 percent you still know that hey I can live I got enough money to pay my bills for the next year or two until the market recovers and I don't have to sell investments when they're down. So, um, you know, people who come to me and they're retired because of, as a result of the market being down like this, are usually a little bit desperate. Um, and it's a, it's a rough position to be in. So getting advice from a financial advisor all along the way to help you navigate all of the different things of life. I think we, yes, we do, we do cost money, but I think that, you know, I, I know in my heart that no matter what I charge, uh, I'm totally worth it. I'm probably worth three or four times what I'm charging because of the mistakes that I help people avoid. Yeah, you, you know, isn't it amazing when you meet folks that are not maxing out their 401k at work or even getting to their maximum employer match, right? That's just like leaving free money uh, on the ground, right? I heard something not too long ago that blew me away, you know, in the, in the range of uh, realm of compound interest. If you invest $10,000 a year between the age of 18 and 28, stop investing. 18 and 28, $10,000 a year, you will have more money when you reach age 65 than if you put $10,000 every year starting at age 28 to age 65 into an account. Isn't that just crazy, you know, how that works? Yeah, it is how it works. Um, I have a little quote that I show people sometimes. It's from Albert Einstein, believe it or not. And Albert Einstein said, the most powerful force in the universe is compound interest. <laughs> yeah, especially over, over time, right? It's a long haul play. Well, you, you brought something up. I'm going to go ahead and ask you about it now. So how is it you, you make your money? Do people send you checks in the mail? Do you work subscription fee? Do you take a cut of the pie? How do you make it work? Yes, so we, we, we're very upfront and transparent about what we charge. And um, there's three different ways that, that, that we charge people. And so it's, it's very flexible and it just depends on what your needs are and what your wishes are. In the past, the old school way is to charge a commission or a transaction cost whenever you buy or sell a, a stock or a mutual fund or a bond or anything, insurance. Um, and you can still do that. And if you're a long-term investor and you, you just want to hold stock the rest of your life, that's probably the cheapest and best way to go. Uh, but, you know, it's not as flexible because if you buy something and then you need to change it, you pay another transaction cost. And that's typically 1% to 3% depending on the security that you're buying. Um, but then we also have types of accounts where we charge an annual fee. And that you know, starts around 1.35%, but the more money you have, it can get quite a bit below 1% a year. 
And with that, that's a fiduciary type of account. What I described earlier, the transaction, that's a best interest type of account where I have to do what's in your best interest. But when I am your fiduciary, and typically that comes with an annual fee. So on $100,000, it'd be, you know, $1,000 or 1200 bucks, depending on where, you know, where you are annually. Um, then I am required to uh, not only do things in your best interest, but I also have to perform. The investments need to perform to what a reasonable person would expect. Uh, and there's some other, some other things in there too. And then we can also take discretion on accounts and, and just manage them for you. Um, but, um, you know, especially if you're young and you're needing help getting going, we do a lot of that work for free because you're saving that money into 401k. So I'm not charging you for that. But as you age and you have more needs, then, you know, you change jobs, you roll over funds, we'll manage it for you. Um, you know, if you're, if we're managing a million dollars for you, um, I might be charging you eight or nine thousand dollars a year. I know that sounds like a lot, but, um, you know, we give you a tremendous amount of service. Cindy answers the phone and says, hi, how you doing? And treats you really nice. Now, um, we have a great team and, um, you know, we have three ladies and, and one gentleman in my office besides me and we provide a ton of service for that. So our goal is to provide as much value as we can. And like I said, whatever I charge, I really firmly feel that the difference that I make in people's lives over time, helping them avoid mistakes, talking them through challenging world times, um, making sure that their risk level is assessed and that we're managing their investments to a level that, of risk that they um, that balances out their, their need for income down the road, but also their need for safety. Um, just providing perspective. So I always, whenever I meet with clients, tell them what's going on in the world. You know, you, you, I tell them mostly, turn off the TV and stop looking at your phone. Because those people are trying to sell you stuff and they're trying to get your attention. And the world is not nearly as bad as you think it is when you're addicted to the news cycle. It's just not that bad. There are tremendous things going on in our world. It's always been a difficult place. It's always going to be a difficult place. But if you invest wisely and you keep a cool head, you're going to do well over time. That's probably more than you were looking for. Nope, not at all. And, uh, you know, any time here, if you guys want to pop in and you got something burning in your head that you want to know about, just kind of, you know, wave your hand at me and I'll try to pay attention and call on you here. You know, by way of an example uh, of where financial planning and then the Nazarene uh, Foundation come together. One of the members of our church here has been employed by somebody for a long time that's a public company. And they've been uh, vested stock in that public company. And they've, their regular tithers and their financial planner said, well, why don't we take some of that, you know, ca you know that stock that you've been given um, that's built up capital gains in there that you've got no basis in because it was gifted to you. Why don't we use that to structure your giving? And so rather than taking it out of his income, he's got a, it's a retirement asset, yes, but he's taken that, transferred it to the uh, foundation, the foundation sold it, transferred that cash to the church. So what's, he, what's he's done, he's preserved current cash flow, he's got, not taking it out of his salary, he's taken something that would have cost him capital gains tax um, and converted it into his giving. So it's a great example uh, of how you know planners you know work together a financial planner and a gift planner um, on that so uh, you know so mark uh, i know you mentioned this earlier that you can help transfer assets and i'd forgotten about the grain right uh, um you know when you think about the nazarene church and the odd things what is the oddest thing the gold bullion is pretty interesting what's the oddest thing that you guys have processed that's been donated we had a nice uh, we had a nice piece of artwork donated a couple years ago. Anybody recognize the name Cy Twombly as an artist? No, we didn't either. He's a scribble artist. So uh, <clears throat> we we drew a lot of attention actually in the uh, in the art world by by receiving two of these. And Nazarene had been in high school with Cy Twombly. He painted mostly in Italy, uh, but we got a picture that was about this big. And uh, when we took it to the appraisers. Um, this this was an antiques roadshow people. Not they weren't recording the show, but it was those people. And when when we walked in with the Cy Twombly picture, the president of the of the ordeal said, 
The Nazarene Foundation has arrived with Asai Twombly and all the counselors that were working with antiques left and gathered around. Uh, it was that big of a deal. Because he, he has had some things that uh, sold for millions of dollars. But they looked at it and they said, you know, it's, uh, it's faded. It's signed on the back. Uh, it's, uh, it's not on the, signed on the front. Small, faded, and it's crayon on paper. Usually he uses oil on canvas. So we had crayon on paper this big. It was scribbling. And they said, we, we'll sell it for you, but we don't think we can get more than about six or $8,000 for it. From our perspective, six or 8000 for a scribble on paper isn't too bad, but when the hammer came down at the auction, it uh, sold for $67,500. Wow. So I'd just wow. like to say that, you know, if the Church of the Nazarene Foundation can sell a piece of scribble on paper, <laughs> crayon on paper, think what we can do to help you. But we, we actually have a unique gift right now that, that's going to be very difficult to sell. Maybe somebody in the room wants this, uh, but we have a set of 51 flags uh, that all flew on uh, in July of 1976, the bicentennial, one on July 4th at the Capitol, and one from every state capital. It's got uh, letters of verification, flagpoles, and uh, oh, you know, like George McGovern's names on there. There's all these letters have names that have people that became uh, became famous uh, later on. Uh, but we found out those are going to be really. We're not going to get 67,000 off of those. <laughs> okay, so if anybody wants 51 flags, we've got them for sale, Joel. There you go. Maybe. I'm just thinking. <laughs> okay, so if I've got something really challenging, I, I, I know where to go now. We'll, we'll, we'll see what weird thing do we have to, to get rid of. You know, we have, a, we have a deer skull collection. You think you can do anything with our deer skull collection? We'll, we'll put it up for auction for you. <laughs> okay, and you can auction it for us. All right. All right. Interesting. So I'm going to look around the room here for just a second. Anybody want to jump out there with anything? Don't be shy, folks. I, I might tack on to your uh, stock illustration because you use the stock from the real or from the uh, retirement accounts, which is super. Uh, but but anybody that has appreciated stock, if if you're going to give ten thousand dollars to your church next year and you have appreciated Apple stock, just give that stock away to the church and take the ten thousand dollars you're going to give and buy the Apple stock again. You just washed all the capital gains tax out. Does that work? That's a sweet deal. It's like the easiest thing in the world. And the qualified charitable distributions, for those of you who are 72 years old, uh, if you're not uh, if you're not taking it, if you're giving anything to the church, regardless of whether you itemize or anything like that, you're probably going to save tax money by uh, doing a qualified charitable distribution from your IRA. Jack, you were going to jump in and say something there. He, he he said it. You know, the qualified charitable distribution. Qualified charitable distribution is a big deal. Uh, being able to tie it through that, so. And we do that for everybody. We'll say, hey, you know, you want to give monthly, quarterly, yearly, and we'll just set it up to go directly from the IRA to the church or the charity. Yeah, we have, we have a few few of our more mature church members who are utilizing this approach. And uh, we actually recently we had to learn about this. We, we had not been receiving them before. And uh, we had somebody, and it was coming from their, their 401k account, and we, you know, what we couldn't figure out is, well, who does the charitable donation receipt go to? It actually doesn't really need to go to anybody, but you send it to the source, to the to the four hundred one k administrator, and they throw it in the trash can. So it's actually what it's doing. It's poof, money's gone from your retirement account. You're never going to pay taxes on it, and and it's a nice way when you're. And this is at 70, 72 now, right? For when you have to take distributions, they're not. Too many people in here that are quite looking down the barrel of this. But there's a point in time when mandatory distributions happen, and maybe you don't need the money, and you have to take the mandatory distribution. This can work in, in that capacity for it. Does that work on an inherited? No, it does, it does not. The, the law does not provide for that. And actually, you can start at 70 and a half, even though the R&D distribution age is 72 now. At 70 and a half, you can do qualified charitable in the year in which you turn 70 and a half, but yeah, the inherited IRA, they will not allow that. So, assuming Dan has this that he wants to give to Grace Community, what, what would be the best way uh, to approach this? Anybody here want to tackle that? I, th I think there are some types of charitable trust that it can go into uh, that will pay you back uh, for a period of time. At least you can use the charitable trust to go on beyond the 10 years, right? You're limited to 10 on that. 
Uh, so we went into a charitable trust could get you beyond that. Unless the person on my right or left says differently. <laughs> to whose wisdom I yield. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you would elaborate a little bit more about trust, and I think it'd be really good to spend a little time contrasting a trust versus a will. And it's actually funny when you said a lot of lawyers say you can't do it just on will. Most people will say, well, what do I want a trust for? That's why to bridge people. Rich people do trust, right? You know, not, not poor people, but well, maybe poor people don't, but you don't have to be rich to Definitely. benefit from a trust. So dive into it, Jane. So I'll tell you that there are a couple of slam dunk reasons that you might need a trust instead of a will. First of all, as I mentioned, in order for a will to be effective, it has to go through the probate court. A trust avoids that completely. So you avoid probate completely. But when I'm listening to people and they're talking to me about their families and their investments and things like that, I, there are two things I watch for. One is, do they have minor children? Because minor children cannot inherit. They, if you're under 18, you cannot inherit. So everybody here who named beneficiaries on any of your assets and said, okay, to my spouse first and then my three kids. If those three kids or any one of them is under 18, then he or she will not be able to inherit. It will have to go through probate and then um, at the end of probate, it's going to be put into a special kind of a trust that the court makes up. Um, and it's under the Uniform Transfer to Minors Act and the court will create a trust, the court will decide who's the trustee, and the terms of it are that that child gets what he or she needs for health, education, maintenance, and support. Those four things come up frequently. All they would get is what they need, which is fine, but then at 18, that trust dissolves, and all that money goes straight into your kid's lap. And it's not typically a good idea to leave an 18-year-old a large amount of money. Now, you may have different opinions on that, and it depends on whether your children are like mine. My kids, I call them allegedly adults. Um, they have, <laughs> they, they get the numerical age, but my husband and I, for example, have planned through a trust for all three of our kids, each of them will get a third of the assets, frankly, after some charitable giving. Yeah, so you can do that charitable giving before you leave the rest or the residue to your kids. But each one of my kids will have his or her own little trust that we have decided on the terms of, that we have decided who's gonna be the trustee that we have decided when they can have access to those assets. This is really important. I talk to every single client about this because you may have the most savvy, wonderful, terrific kids known to man, but there are things that happen that they don't plan on, maybe a divorce. If you have left your child um, money in his or her lap, then he or she gets a divorce, it's highly likely that half of those assets will go out the door with the, with the divorcing spouse. The other thing is good people, good money managers have creditors. Um, it, uh, these days it's healthcare debt, it's student debt, obviously, things like that. But um, you can protect the kids from creditors creditors and divorcing spouses by putting the money in a small trust like I talked about. They're protective trusts. And for example, what we did, you can't tell anyone this, Bill, what, what our, we did for our allegedly adult children is we um, have said they get what they need for health, education, maintenance, and support um, until they turn 35, and two of them are already 35. 
So we've kind of crossed that threshold. But um, so at 35, they have the authority to withdraw up to a third of the assets that we're leaving them. Um, and that you need to be very careful that it doesn't say shall distribute at 35 because they could be going through a divorce. They could have creditors, poof, it's gone. So instead we say they have the authority to withdraw up to a third. If they leave it in there, they'd be really smart. They've been waiting to take the vacation of a lifetime, great. Go to Tahiti, take $20,000 out and leave everything else in there protected even though they could have access to up to that third immediately. But the smart thing to do is to leave it there and keep it protected. Then when my kids turn 40, then they can have access, they have the authority to withdraw up to another third. When they turn 45, then they can have any or all of it. They could withdraw any or all of it. Up to this point, we've named a trustee. It happens to be a trust company for us. We decided the best thing to do would be to have a corporate trustee. So it's a disinterested third party and nobody has to get mad at somebody for not giving them money. Um, so at that point, when they turn 45, they can fire the trustee and they can be their own trustee. There's only one downside to that, but it's easily solved. Um, if a creditor comes calling and I'm the, the trustee of my own inherited trust, okay, not my revocable living trust, but if I had inherited from a parent into a trust, then a creditor comes and they say, well, you're the trust, the trust is you. You know, you can't, you can't hide behind that. All that has to happen is, I would have to name a disinterested third party to co-trustee with me. So I call up Bill and I say, would you be, would you be co-trustee with me for this purpose? And he would say, sure. And then he would say, no, you can't have it, creditors, <laughs> because he's disinterested. Well, he'd probably be interested, but not legally. <laughs> um, anyway, so they, that's how that works for us. And um, you know, if it's all, if it's invested, if your assets, when, when they trickle down to your kids are invested with Edward Jones, then, you know, Edward Jones will be the first one to tell you that, um, I hope they keep, I hope they keep their money here at Edward Jones, but they don't have to. I did that when my parents passed because they had trusted this person with their assets for all these years. So I said, let's give it a go. So it doesn't happen very often. Um, people have their own uh, known advisors and such, which is fine. But anyway, that's the way you can protect it from creditors, predators, and divorcing spouses. And you may say things like, oh, you know, I love my son's spouse. I love her to death. She's never leaving. Um, and even if she does leave, I'm still gonna give her something and you like her very much until she's walking out the door with the pool boy. And then you don't like her as much and you don't want her to take your money with her because she's gonna marry somebody else, maybe the pool boy, she's gonna marry someone else and then leave your money to someone else, someone else's kids that you had worked hard to earn. So. There are little things like that. Um, the thing, the important part of the blended family position, the way you can accidentally disinherit is because I'm gonna pretend I'm on a second marriage, okay? And um, when I die, I'm gonna leave everything to my husband because I love him dearly and I know he'll do the right thing, but he gets all of that money and then my kids stop calling him. My kids don't show up for holidays. They talk badly to him. They make huge mistakes. And my husband says, eh, I don't think she'd want that. I think we're gonna just leave it to my kids. And you, the deceased person, have accidentally disinherited your children. So there are ways around that and they're very important ways. These are important things. So even though, you know, I say I've got three little trusts for my three kids. Some people say, I'm dead, I don't care. 
and that's fine too. Then you can leave it to them outright as long as they're not under the age of majority. Um, one other thing I'd like to say, people make the mistake of saying, my kids get along great. They will not fight when I die. Yeah, right now, tell yourself, they're fighting. They may get through it, but the reason they're fighting is not greed, it's grief. And I truly believe that. My mom was the very last of my family to die, my dad, my brother, and then my mom. And when she died, everything in that house became so important to me that I couldn't let it go. Well, my deceased brother had three kids and they were supposed to get their half. And I just couldn't see through that. I was blinded by grief. And, you know, I'd give them part of the money, I'd give them half the money, but it's my parents and I want what's in their house. And um, it, it turned out okay. Um, we had some moments though, because your kids are gonna act on grief. Even if you don't have very much money, there's a, um, one of my clients had like five kids, I think, and all of them wanted the brownie pan. All of them. <laughs> it apparently made phenomenal brownies, I don't know, but everybody wanted the brownie pan, and it became a really big problem. I haven't read it, but I just learned there's a book out that's called Who Gets the Yellow Pie Plate? And it's a, about that same thing. So do your very, very best to plan ahead so that your kids know you cared and that they can be taken care of in a way that pleases them, but also they understand that mom and dad thought this was important. So. I would, would you say that from the auctioneer standpoint, the, uh, the yellow plate and the brownie pan, it's good to let those go to the auction. Because the auctioneer gets a commission off of yeah. dramatically escalated prices that the kids are <laughs> willing to pay. Literally, I mean, I've seen that in auctions over and over. But yeah. um, your question on trusts, you've heard me use the word trust a time or two here. I'm almost, almost exclusively not talking about a typical revocable trust like Jane is talking about. Um, trust can be a, 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 like an umbrella term. So when you hear me talk about it, I'll be talking about some type of charitable trust. Uh, where whether it even if it pays back the family or pays back the donor, um, then uh, we were typically we are the foundation is typically the trustee in those, and the um, after the gift splits and does what it needs to do for the family, it leaves a nice gift for the church. Well, the gift to the church should come first, off the top. That's just my opinion. And then you deal with the pie plate. Jack, I think you've been wanting to jump in on this subject. Uh, I do, because I have a unique perspective as the guy who's there when the family shows up after someone has passed away. One of the greatest privileges and passions for me in the world, by the way, is helping widows work through. Um, we have a lot of widows and widowers in, in our branch, and um, it's, um, it's just a lot of fun to love on them and to help them through and, and make sure that they don't make mistakes because your brain just doesn't work when it's grieving at all. Um, but w one of the things that, that a couple of things that Jane was referring to is um, sometimes it, it people come in and um, I read a statistic the other day that when people inherit money, it's 25 days until the new car is in the driveway and it's less than six months before the average inheritance is completely gone. And uh, witnessing that in my career, just I literally get physically ill when I see people do that. So I would encourage you to talk to your families. And I like what she said about setting up trust because, you know, money is money. Some people cannot be when it, when you uh, come into a sizable sum of money. Some people just they just can't handle it, and that's okay. So you can, uh, you know, I've had clients say, "Well, I don't want to rule them from the grave." Well, they they need that. That's what's best for some folks, but you know, being able to hand it out over time, I think, is really wise because I don't know about you, but I was a whole different person when I was 40 years old than when I was 25. Just completely different person. Um, so I, I would encourage you to talk to your children, and um, one of the things we do in our office too is have a family meeting, and we'll bring the parents in, and they'll talk, bring the kids in when they're here for the holidays, and we'll sit down and talk it through. We'll share about what. You know, sometimes we'll share them out. Sometimes we'll just talk about it in general terms. But 
um, meet with the family and um, you know, I help the parents figure out, hey, you know, how do we want to pass this wealth on? What do we want to do? And just make sure that the family's on the same page. And that does make it easier in most cases. Stephanie, did you want to ask something? Oh, I thought I saw you wave your hand a minute ago. There, there's a lot of opportunity for being pastoral through that whole process of death and of inheriting, but it, it really does parallel uh, the people that win the lottery, you know, you don't inherit things every day. You don't win the lottery every day. But if you win the lottery, um, a significant sum, you're more likely to go bankrupt than the average person in the next 10 years. And so I, I've, I've got this little thing in the back of my head that someday I'd like to write a, a booklet or something for pastors that's pastoring people through windfalls or through inheritance like that. And it's, it's so much on my mind when uh, my sister and I lost my, my dad a year ago. And uh, we just decided we're not spending a dime of his money for a year. We're just going to look at it. We're going to put it in our own bank accounts and, and w let a year uh, go by so that we don't make foolish decisions. Boy, that's the truth, too. I mean, if you are in grief, in active grief, you're not thinking clearly at all. So I completely agree with all of that. And any help that you can get, whether it's through leaving it in a trust, through leaving part of it to the foundation so that they can help you through it or um, leaving it with Edward Jones or whomever to talk to the kids and help them through that. I, I neglected to say what the other reason was that I tell people they need a trust. There are two things. It isn't about how much money. It's about do they have minor children or do they want to protect their adult children and do they own a business. Um, because you can't easily pass any kind of a business without probate. And so to avoid that, if you're a business owner, I always recommend a trust. So those are the two things. I just like to be sure that people understand that, like Bill said, you don't have to be rich to need a trust. It's just smart planning. No, yeah, it's all about control, right? I mean, if you're going through the court, even with the will, mm -hmm. you give up a lot of control over it. If you've got a trust, you've thought about it in advance and had a chance right. to express your wishes and desires and evaluate your children. And some of you may have had to go through probate with a sibling or a parent, um, and it's just not fun. You've just lost a person that you love potentially more than anyone else in the world, and you are dealing with courts and judges and court dates and lawyers, no one wants to deal with lawyers. Um, I, I'm better than that. But <laughs> you're, you're a good lawyer. Actually, on my website, it says, I want to dissuade you of any of your preconceived notions of what lawyers are like, because I don't act like a lawyer. And people say, you're a lawyer? And that's exactly what I want to hear. I don't want to appear in any way pompous, better than anybody else. We're all just folks, and that's why I enjoy what I do, is helping folks. You know, one thing that hasn't come up yet, but we've been experiencing in my family because of the recent death of my parents is, are you organized? Do your kids know where to find your stuff? We, my dad was organized, and it turns out not all the way. We're like, where are the life insurance policies? Who's got the life insurance policies? Well, we don't have them, who's got them? And my brother ended up doing a file by file search and we have no idea why dad filed them the way he filed them, finally found them. Uh, but it was like, okay, so you, you know, phone numbers, do your kids know who your advisor is? Do they know who your lawyer is? Do they know who your banker is, right? So one of the things, or who, or who your pastor is, right? Good point. Yeah, it's a good point. So, you know, part of Jane's package is a, you know, a little portfolio where you, can, where you can add your stuff. And I, I sat down and I went through my files and I thought, what do, if I'm not here, what do my wife and my kids need to know? And let's talk about passwords, <laughs> right? Who gets the Facebook account? Who gets the Twitter account? This is serious, you gotta plan for this. So, you know, there are tools for that, password managers that you can share, right? You can, you can set it up. So, you know, this is, you know, are you leaving your family in a lurch, right, by not planning and not being organized? And this is what they're talking about, 
is, is, is real fundamental, and it goes on beyond there about how organized you can be. So uh, I have a question for Mark, but yes, Nancy, jump in there. So I can repeat that question so everybody hears it. So if you're an only child and you've got down to one parent, what do you need to be doing or thinking about in that situation? And probably all three of you might have things to contribute to that. Hello. Grab your microphone. Do you have children? You do. So you just need a plan in place that says if something happens to your parent, your living parent, and also happens to you, that there's a plan in place for her assets, your mom or your dad, that, that person's assets, to go past you, but to your kids. Not past you and out the door, but. Yeah, yeah you, because, because, um, a, a will requires probate. So no matter what pretty little language you put in there about where you want things to go, in order for those instructions to be followed, it has to go through probate. And being an only child of an only child, I'm not. But um, I had a friend, I helped her in her age. Um, I was her trustee and her power of attorney and things like that. And she was um, an only child of two only children. Both of her parents were only children as well. That's a really, that's a really small pool. Um, and she had no children. Yeah, so the, the trust planning for her was very important. And if she, she couldn't leave it to her kids, um, but she left it to her little church Oh man, I can't remember the name of the little Kansas town, but I can't even imagine what they did with that money, you know. Uh, but but you need to have a plan for that, you know. If if she passes and you're already gone, she could have planned for this. If she still has her capacity, she should do this, do the planning, and make sure it goes where she wants it to go. I'm not sure I answered your question. Right. That's right. That's right. Oh, that's, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, and time to be thinking, you know, what if she becomes disabled, incapacitated, how, how do you have the right to step in and manage the affairs and deal with it? So having the and right you, paperwork in place. And you don't have the right to do that without the paperwork. Um, you will have to take the issue to a court, to a probate court, even when she's still alive, and have um, somebody named, it, it's like conservator, guardian and conservator, but you have to go to court to do it. It completely avoids that if you have these powers of attorney in place. I, I would probably start there. Mm -hmm. When when I, in my non-lawyer fashion, talk about the difference between trusts and wills, uh, I like to talk about the speed at which these things happen. Because I think in Missouri, you're looking at a fast, you, you would be on the fast track in nine months, probably, to go through. That's the, the least amount of time it can take, mm -hmm. is nine months. And it's usually, I probably it probably averages about a year and a half. Whereas the trust is very, very fast. E even something as simple as selling a car, uh, you know, if your mother passes away, you can't sell her car if there's an, if you're not a trustee of her trust. Um, if she has a, a trust, yeah, I, in a trust, in a trust, it would be very quick, though. And um, it's funny that you use cars for that example because Kansas is extremely liberal on letting the next of kin, so to speak, inherit the car without probate. Missouri, you people call me and they say I can't sell this, you know, junk. Car. It's only worth $2,000, but I can't sell it. And I said, no, you've got to go through probate. But in Kansas, you can get away with at least one car without probate. The DMV lets you do that.
Yeah, so yeah, the question was, so which is a great question to talk about a little bit. Uh, um, payable on death and transfer on death are some mm -hmm. options for some assets. So. Yeah, so were you talking about cars? So if you take your title, your car title, and $11, and if you live in Johnson County, this is in Miami. Are we in Miami County? Uh, no, we're in Johnson County still, okay. by a few feet. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna call it the dreaded Johnson County DMV. And if you um, go there with your title and $11 and fill out their form, then they will send your title, the form, and the money to Topeka, and they will reissue your title with a payable on death beneficiary on it. So if you name it payable on death to child one, then when you pass, he or she takes it to the DMV and they put the title in his or her name. So that's the best way, in my opinion, to handle cars if you don't have a trust. May I, may I ask a question? Uh, having just gone through this and done exactly that thing with my dad's vehicles in Ohio, we were also able to do that with real estate. Can you have transfer on death real estate deeds here? Yes, in both Kansas and Missouri. You can have a, and this is what we recommend if you use a will-based plan because you don't want that house or that property to have to go through probate. So there's something called a beneficiary deed or a payable on death deed, and we would create that for you. We would draft it, get it recorded, but um, that is how it happens. By operation of law, nobody has to say it. The court doesn't have to say it. Nobody has to say anything. It's just by operation of law, if you've named a beneficiary on that. Do they have that in Ohio? Yes, it, uh, my, my father passed away on uh, the 17th of July last year, on the 1st of September, uh, because everything was transferred on death. Mm -hmm. um, the cars were transferred, all of the deeds were fixed and recorded within six weeks. Actually, we never opened probate, there wasn't anything left to probate. Right, so. and usually in, in many states, a home has to be probated. Real property has to be probated. There just used to be just a handful of states that had the ability to do that payable on death deed and avoid probate, but we can here. So, so one thing to think about, right, when you do that it is so you do a transfer on death, payable on death to somebody, well, what happens if they actually died before you did, right? So those, those type of approaches need maintenance on them, right, as opposed That's to a true. trust, which can be very dynamic for doing it. But there are just things you, you just don't, you're not going to put in your trust, right? It's just not right. worth the hassle, and so you use that, that type of approach. The three things, there are two things you cannot put in the name of your trust I mentioned before. Um, you your have, kids. You, your kids, no, you can't do that. But um, also, you can't, uh, an IRA can't be owned by a living trust. There are certain irrevocable trusts that can hold IRAs. That's not what we're talking about in a typical plan. Um, and life insurance, both of those things have to be owned by a human person. So they don't go into your trust until you've passed. And cars are another one that I don't recommend to most people that they put their car in the trust. I recommend they own that car with their spouse if they have one, and when one of them passes, the other one owns the car. When the second of them passes, it needs to have a TOD to the trust. So it doesn't actually, isn't even actually owned by the trust. There are a couple of reasons for that. One is that if you get in a car wreck and the person who hit you or whom you hit um, sees that the car is owned by a trust, guess what they think? They think money. you're rich. Yeah, money. That's right. And they, as human nature, we just have to accept that some people would say, oh, I think I really did hurt my neck way worse than I thought I did, or things like that. So that's one reason. And the other one is that if you want to sell your car to someone off the street, not a, not a dealer, like a dealership, but if you want to sell your car to me and you own it as a trustee of your trust, then you would turn it over and you would write your name, sold to Jane Williams for this amount, just like you would. But then when I take that title to the DMV, they're gonna ask me for proof 
that you have the authority to do that on behalf of the trust so you have to take in the sellers the buyer has to take in the sellers trust information to the d m v it we just we trade cars too often that but i want it in the trust at the end of the day but not while you're living jack you've been wanting to jump in yeah um part of what we do for our clients is we do a comprehensive estate plan review we don't give legal advice but we know lots of professionals like Jane that that we can talk to to help our clients. We make sure that you're organized and that you have an estate plan and that you've thought about all these things. And um, for the lady who was talking about her mom, you know, one thing you want to make sure you absolutely have, and you can put it on file with your financial advisor. Um, and I ask all of my clients if they have a durable power of attorney, go ahead and give it to me, and we'll scan it in, and we've got it, and then. Once that is needed, it's seamless. Um, we can go right into that, and we also do trust accounts where we know who the trustees, the successor trustees are that can um, you know, take over for a client who's disabled. And um, so that can be pretty seamless as well. Um, but we do beneficiary reviews. We, we look at every asset, life insurance. I can't tell you how many times um, people have had the wrong beneficiary on things, you know, ex-wives or dead people or, um, you know, it's just bizarre sometimes when, when we look at everything where the beneficiaries are. Um, you know, I even had one where it was left to an ex-wife and the ex-wife had passed away and the insurance company went in and changed it to their daughter. So it's kind of funny how those, you would never think those things would happen, but they do. Um, and then the other thing is just, um, you know, making sure that um, all those things are in one place. We also do a, a financial organizer where you can put all that information and make your wishes known to and tell your kids where it is. So um, just, just you got to be organized and you have to ask people what they think, um, what they want to have happen, communicate with your family, um, with your parents. Um, you know, I've had those conversations with my mom and, you know, my mom and dad are divorced and and so that blended family thing is it's really you know difficult so those are special situations that just become a nightmare for the family then for me and for cindy and for the rest of our office i just want to add one thing to that i absolutely love working with your financial advisor um, i invite them to our meetings if you want them there there's a comfort level that you already have with that person and if you want him or her to come with you or for the very first meeting, I can go to their office, whatever you're comfortable with. But it's a big part of what I do is working with your financial advisor. We do that and we also work with their CPAs and any other professional that they might have. And their gift counselor? Thing. The gift, their the gift, gift plan. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask about that, Mark. How often do you get invited for? Uh, more often than you'd think. Is that Actually, right? Yeah, we sit down with uh, the attorney and the financial planner. Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people out there are generous, right? And they want to make sure their giving wishes extend beyond, you know, the last days. You know, post death giving is a big deal. Yeah, Joel. Living proof right there. Yeah. yeah. And we are going to wind down here pretty quick. I want to respect everybody's time and get out of here pretty quick here. Do I, anybody got, I do have one last thing for Mark. I do want to ask, but if anybody else wants to jump in, I'd rather give you the time than me. That's a very good question. And most estate planning attorneys do guardianships and conservatorships. I do not. I did for a long time, and um, I just decided to focus on what I do best. And um, 
I share office space with another lawyer who does everything I don't do. So um, I could easily help you find a lawyer to work with you on a guardianship. Yeah. So Mark, Mark one thing we had not had a chance to really talk about, but you, you did mention it a little bit. Would you just real quick, would you talk about what you can do for individuals in the way of, you know, what is a donor advice fund? What, what is a, a you know, a uh, I forgot what you call it, a charitable trust kind of thing. Uh -huh. And I did also want to comment, and I may have put it in something I can't remember, but uh, one of the things the Nazarene Foundation actually does to support Nazarene churches is they actually invest our money for us. So we actually, as Grace Community, we have some surplus funds and they're actually the, the organization that we give them and they've got an investment advisory company that they hire so it's a great mechanism you know that we, we we trust what they're going to do they're going to be good stewards they make a little money off of it so it's kind of a win-win uh, uh, for the Nazarene denomination but yeah so talk about just the last couple of things and we'll probably wind down with that because I'm thinking there might be a couple of folks in here you know with the spare you know a couple hundred grand half million that trying to figure out what to do with it when they die or we, before they die we can usually answer that question pretty quickly so <clears throat> The donor advised funds are, uh, are, are very popular this day, these days. About 20% of charitable, gi charitable giving comes through a donor advised fund and it's, it's a little bit like a charitable savings account. Uh, so if you have a windfall or some reason that you need uh, to do charitable giving but you really don't have the, uh, the project in mind or the, the place that you want that to land, you can put it in the charitable account. It will be invested and hopefully grow uh, while you're making your mind up. So if you're, if you were uh, that 18 year old that needs to be saving some money right away, but you're at 18 years old, your dream is to have your name on a building at Mount Mid American Nazarene University. You can start chucking that in right now and save that for the next 30 years. But really, uh, young folks have a, have a lot of passion and dreams for life, uh, and many of them would like to retire at 50 or 55 and do missions work, you know, or volunteer somewhere. If you save into a charitable account, you get your tax deduction early all along throughout the way and that just grows in their income tax free and uh, you can do some serious uh, charitable things out there. Uh, some people bunch deductions into it since uh, very few people uh, deduct anymore. If you're donating $20,000 a year uh, to this local church and that's your only charitable deduction, you're, you as a couple fall under the uh, the limit there for the uh, for the standard deduction. If you put sixty thousand dollars in one year, you get a significant tax deduction. The next two years, the money comes into the church the same way. The church doesn't see any difference there, uh, but you get you get all your deduction in one year instead of over three years, where it's more effective for you. Might also mention the charitable gift annuity. You don't look all that old to me out there, but uh, charitable gift annuities we can write in forty eight states, and they are popular when people have a lot of years under their belt and when interest is low, which is the way it has been. So if you, uh, if you are a, a 90 year old and you have $10,000 and you walk into the bank and they tell you your percentage rate's gonna be 1% or so, uh, gift annuity will get you a guaranteed about 8.8 .8 on that uh, for the remainder of your life. If you're a very young person like me, that wouldn't work as well. But uh, the older you are, uh, the gift annuities work and that one also bypasses your will and your uh, and your revocable trust to, and go straight to the church. It actually is the church's money until you go to heaven. So we have uh, several of those things that work on the outside. Maybe the remainder trust, did we talk about that just a little bit? Seems like most of the remainder trusts we do are from rental homes where people have deducted everything they can deduct and expensed it out so their basis in the rental home is really low. Let's say the rental home's worth $100,000 and their basis is twenty. dollars they're going to pay capital gains on $80,000 if they sell it. And uh, collecting rent and fixing pipes is getting old. So uh, if they put that piece of real estate into a charitable remainder trust, uh, we will work a, a, a percentage, typically 5 6 or 7% of that, hundred, of that sale value comes back to the individual every year. And then the remainder, all of that that's left over, uh, goes to the church at the end. And you get a... Uh, charitable deduction on the front end of that, bypass all the capital gains tax, that's a way to win. All right, thanks. So uh, we'll let that be Mark's final word probably. Uh, uh, Jack, Jane, any final words? Mark, but if you do also have any 
gem that you'd like to share here at the end. Any, any final words, and then we'll let Mark close us with a little prayer. You're okay, Liz on. I would just say don't be afraid to contact professionals like attorneys and financial advisors and um, gifting folks at the Nazarene Foundation. Um, they're available, you know, we're willing to work with anyone and everyone to make a difference. I think all three of us feel that way. Um, you know, we all do what we do um, because um, we, well, me personally anyway, and I, I sense that from, from Jane and Mark as well. Um, I'm thankful that I get to serve in a position where I can serve others. And uh, so don't want you to be afraid um, to feel like you can't approach a professional and um, have them make your life better. That's what we do and that's what we thrive on. Anything you'd like to close with, Jane? You're good. Well, before Mark closes us in prayer, would y'all join me? Just give him a little appreciation for being here. Really, thank you guys for taking your time to be here with us. Really enjoyed it. I, th I think we all have business cards and um, business cards and literature in the back. Yep, B business cards, brochures, and pins. If you like a nice, bright orange safety pin, uh, Jane, Jane, her corporate colors apparently are orange on there. So, all right, Mark, you want to just close us sure. here? Lord, the amazing thing about all this is how much you have blessed us. And uh, we live in the uh, richest of times and the richest of places and the richest of time of history. And we just don't know why you've blessed us so much. But we want to reflect your generosity and give. We also want to be really good stewards of what we have. So, Lord, for uh, each of us here tonight, uh, maybe, uh, maybe there's a few things that have gone through folks' minds that are saying, I should do this. This is a step I should take. I'd ask that you'd grant the courage and make that path very clear and visible as to how that should happen in life. And uh, we acknowledge that you are, you are the giver, Lord. You have given and given and given to us. And so we want to be good stewards of all those things and share it with those around us who are in need as well as sharing it with you. Thank you so much for loving us, Lord, for this great church. May you put your blessings on every aspect of it. Amen. Amen. Thank you.